Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. Quick hitter edition, we're going to go out to South Philly, and we're going to talk about a delicate subject matter that I feel like warrants um, reporting, and there's some nuance to this, and I want to be clear um, about what we know for sure, what we know has been alleged, um, and this is regarding the Philadelphia Mafia and the Gardner Museum robbery, the famous half billion dollar heist uh, from March 1990 that was pulled off by the Boston Mafia, uh, 13 pieces of very rare artwork, including Rembrandt's and Monet's and Vermeer's um, were stolen. They've yet to be recovered. Now, um, 34 years later, and there had been reports you know, I'm, I'm not the first one to report this part of it. There have been reports a while back that some of those paintings, some of the stolen paintings, some of the stolen artwork passed through Philadelphia in the early 2000s um, through Rittenhouse Square via the uh, Philadelphia Mafia had created a, a New England branch in the late 90s. Um, and people from from the New England crew of the Philadelphia Mafia allegedly got their hands on a portion of these paintings. And some people believe that they were sold in Philadelphia. This brings us to the conversation at hand. I've reported recently on uh, the fact that there were some forms of meetings that took place, uh, let's say between 2012 and 2016 with either members of the Philadelphia Mafia or people representing the Philadelphia Mafia sitting down with the FBI to discuss what if scenarios relating to the paintings and if they could be retrieved is the statute of limitations over with? Could they re, uh, recover the $10 million reward? And I know at least one of these meetings took place. I got it from somebody that was there. There's allegations of a second meeting taking place. There are allegations after I reported this that um, some of these uh, details are being conflated and that the meetings weren't necessarily voluntary. But I think it 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 warrants some some conversation. So Joey Merlino was locked up when these paintings allegedly came through Philadelphia. Um, Joey and his successor as uh, as boss of the Philadelphia Mafia, Georgie Boy Borghese, created this. New England crew back around 1997, 1998, and had activity going up uh, in Massachusetts and uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut. And he was mad. And, and th this part, I'm, I, I have no doubt that this part, this part of it is true. Uh, Joey Merlino came out of prison in 2011, for lack of a better term, on the war path to find the paintings and or extract tribute from the sale of some of these paintings that he was not afforded when he was locked up was, according to his camp, kept in the dark about, um, and that he was calling meetings with people in his crime family, as well as trying to reach out to other crime families to try to track down these paintings. Um, a, because he was aware the statute of limitations were off and that you could return these paintings for a $10 million reward without any, um, you know, no, no punishment, no arrest. Uh, and again, this was, a, this was a twofold thing. Merlino wanted to find the painting so he could get the $10 million reward. Uh, but he also wanted to clear up, and I don't think it, I think we're now 13 years later and it has not been cleared up from what I understand why he was cut out of his share 
considering it was his crime family at the time, his share of the black market sales of, of at least I'm told one to three of those paintings. And one of the paintings that I'm told was allegedly sold was the crown jewel of the heist. Um, it was uh, Rembrandt's only seascape painting. Um, I think it's called the Sea of Galilee. And I, I've been told by people that uh, were very close to the people that had the paintings, allegedly, the New England guys, uh, that one of those paintings was moved uh, through Philadelphia on the black market to a doctor, a medical doctor for his private collection. Um, now, this is all stuff we know for sure. Whether or not Joey was sanctioning meetings with the FBI or attending a meeting with the FBI to have this conversation is still up for debate. I have been told by two people that Joey might have been present at one of these meetings. I've been told by other people that the meetings were not um, sanctioned or called by Joey, but that when he was uh, meeting with people for his case and for or for some of his cases over the years and other things related to the FBI that uh, they just questioned him on it. It wasn't any type of uh, meeting of the minds per se, and that uh, they questioned him and, and that Joey didn't give them any answers. Other people have said, people that I trust, including a, a retired FBI agent that says that he was at one of these meetings, um, claims that the very least Joey had sanctioned somebody to speak on his behalf to discuss the possibility that the Philly LCN group could retrieve the paintings for the government and return them. And if they did, um, collect the $10 million still scot-free. Um, some people that have reported this to me or said this to me says that say that Joey was present. Other people say that Joey sent liaisons. Either way, it's it's very newsworthy in, in terms of both the ongoing active investigation with the Gardner Museum robbery, which is from what I again what I'm told outside of Jimmy Hoffa, which is always been top priority unsolved crime for the FBI. The second, and, and this day and age, maybe the more important case that the FBI is hell-bent on solving is the Gardner Museum, is the Gardner Museum heist. And they can't arrest anybody. Nobody can put be put in jail for this at this point, but they want to retrieve the paintings. Uh, the museum itself keeps that the room that the paintings were taken of. I think it's called the Dutch Room. Um, and they uh, all the all the uh, the frames are empty. They've been empty for 34 years, waiting for um, them to be returned to their their rightful spot. Uh, FBI that invested the Gardner Museum uh, investigated Gardner Museum believes there was an inside man. Um, if you watch the there's a Netflix documentary on you can watch it that kind of goes into the the guy that they alleged to have been an inside man. He was kind of a hippie. Um, going to like a Grateful Dead concert the next day. Just some stuff about his story doesn't really always make sense. But um, the Boston guys got in there dressed as, as police officers, had a, an hour of unfettered access, got away with 13 paintings, a half billion dollars. They had no idea what they were looking for. And I, I find it interesting that a lot of the, narr the narrative of the, the heist was this, this brilliant art heist. If it had been a brilliant art heist, they would have walked away with $5 billion worth of art. These guys stumbled upon half a billion, not knowing what they were taking um, and kind of crudely ripping them out of the, the frames, which also affect their uh, value. Um, they originally had planned to do the heist with Miles Connor, who was like a real life Thomas Crown, a guy that did art heist for a living. He was planning it with them, and then Miles got locked up, and they didn't want to wait until Miles got free again, so they went and did it themselves. Without someone like Miles Connor, they had no idea how to 
move the art on the black market. It's a very complex underworld in, in, in the um, stolen art um, space. And a lot of the guys that, that did the job are dead. One guy that is alleged to have possibly been one of the trigger men or, or possibly the, the getaway driver, David Turner, just got out of prison a year or two ago. But I suspect that these paintings, the ones that either weren't sold or um, never made it to a discussion about being sold, are laying buried somewhere in some type of safety deposit box or a storage locker, and they're there, and the person that put them there is dead. Therefore, no one knows where they are. That That's my amateur analysis of why they have not returned those paintings. But I do believe my sourcing when, I, when I'm when i told that some of these paintings came through Philadelphia and uh, were moved. And, you know, whether or not there was any type of sanctioned meeting with the FBI, if you're going by the letter of the law of La Cosa Nostra, Merlino has a valid point. That's money that's owed to him. He was doing time. He was doing 12 years. Um, and I, I wonder how this is still plays today because I'm told that it's a trigger. Um, so I don't mean to trigger you, Joey, not looking to trigger the other people that might be on the other end of this that held out on you. But, um, I think it's, it's of note. I think anybody that has any information regarding the, the museum paintings, the missing paintings should, could contact the FBI in Boston right now. Um, and go collect your $10 million reward. Um, and this is just kind of more, I would say, fallout from um, Joey Merlino's alleged shelving reported by Jerry Capace at Gangland News. We reported before that term was, was put out there that there had been a restructuring and Joey was no longer boss. Jerry called it a shelving, Jerry Capace. Um, and since then, there's been kind of this like a cascade of information on Joey that maybe wouldn't have come out before that's coming out now. Um, and this came to me from a retired FBI agent that was allegedly at one of these meetings. So take it for what it's worth. I wanted to contextualize it um, and uh, give some analysis. But... That's the story of the Philadelphia Mafia, the Gardner Museum paintings, and Skinny Joey Merlino. Please like, subscribe, and share. Uh, we're uncovering the underworld one region, one city, one country, one story at a time here. Breaking news, wall to wall, all week. Uh, check out, like, subscribe, share. Check out our Patreon where we do a little bit more uh, history, some non LCN stuff, a little bit more. Uh, analysis. You get the uh, long form interviews. You get your first look at them quicker than you would on the YouTube. You get a longer director's cut, um, probably a good 15, 20 minutes more than you get on the YouTube with the interviews. So keep coming back. We love giving you all this uh, content. We're, we're churning and burning 24-7. OG pod, Scott Bernstein. I'm out.